to the worship of God at First Church in Glastonbury, Connecticut. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. This means you are welcome here. You are safe to sing, laugh, or shed a tear. You are welcome here if you are happy or sad, confused or inspired, full of faith or full of questions, young or old, poetic or pragmatic, or a combination of all those things. You are welcome in our community, no matter your religion, your ethnicity, who you love, where you grew up, how much money you have, or the color of your skin. For here, we proclaim that each person is valuable, loved, and essential. This is a place of peace and grace where all God's children have a home. Here, all are loved and no one stands alone. You are welcome here. All, all are, are welcome, welcome here. here. Yes, you are welcome here. All are welcome here. All are welcome to our worship here at First Church of Christ in Glastonbury, Connecticut. First Church is a big-hearted, caring, compassionate, generous, and mission-oriented congregation. And we invite you to get involved in all our opportunities and events for faith, fellowship, and fun. So please check our website, our newsletter, and your blast emails. And on this first weekend of the summer season, we encourage you to be aware that in the coming weeks and months, we are thankfully getting ready to pivot. A great word to say how we are evolving with our ways of worshiping. We have a few more weeks of pre-recorded services on our YouTube channel, and then beginning on July 11th, a combination of in-person worship in our meeting house, live streaming, and then the recorded service available at our YouTube channel. Sign up is required for the in-person worship service. Again, all the details of our summer worship can be found on our church's website. Let us now worship God and join our hearts in our opening prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. You lift us up, Holy One. On wings like eagles, you enable us to soar with the possibilities of revolution, transformation, and resilience, both within our own souls and within this world which needs so much care. We need your strength to not grow weary as we continue to hope for new life and as we work for your compassion and wholeness. Help us, Holy One, so we may again catch a glimpse of the vast possibilities of your shalom, even as we pray for it here on earth, by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Hi everyone, it's good to see you. The other day I was at the flower store and I was wearing this mask and some nice lady came up to me and said, I like your mask. I said thanks and smiled. Hopefully she could tell by my eyes. So it got me thinking about church and about if we tell people about our church and how great it is. Then it got me thinking about some people who maybe don't have a church community and maybe how they want a church community. So what makes our church so special? What do you think? Some of the words that come to my mind are we're a community that's full of joy, right? We try to smile and make the world a better place. I think we're a community that's full of love because the world needs love and each of us need love. And we're a community full of people who are really dedicated, who work hard to make the world a better place and to make our community an even better place. So then I was thinking about, I've been here at First Church for a long time, 18 years this month. When I first came, what I did is I worked with the little kids. And one of the families that I worked with was the Swan family. And this week, I had the pleasure and the privilege of going into Hartford because Aaron Swan, the youngest of the three children, but he's not that young anymore because he just graduated from college, had decided a long time ago that he wanted to be in the Air Force. And so I got to go into Hartford and be with the Swan family this week and send Aaron off to basic training. Aaron was just a little kid when I came to First Church, and now he's a grown-up man who's serving our country. We are so proud of Aaron. While I was there visiting with the Swan family, they kept saying how special church was, our church, First Church in Glastonbury. And then also this week, I went to a cemetery right here in town, and I did a small funeral for an older person who was a lifelong member of this church who passed away. And guess what? All they kept saying was how wonderful First Church is, how it was such a caring and hope-filled place. Then it got me thinking about, well, why is First Church a great place to be? Well, it's a great place to be because of you, because of all the people that make it so great. It's a great place to be because we try to come together as a community and love one another and help one another. Are we perfect? No way. Do we keep striving to be faithful people? All the time. So boys and girls, I hope and pray that you get to grow up in this church, just like Aaron and Michael and Gracelyn and go to church school and do youth fellowship and sing in the choir and do so much more. And I hope you know that you are loved by this church and all the people in it, by your pastors, by your leaders, and so many more. Now, boys and girls, will you help me pass the peace? You'll stand up and say to your adult, may the good news of God's love be with you. Let us pass the peace. This weekend, we are recognizing and perhaps celebrating at least three happenings. The first day of summer, Father's Day, and Juneteenth. Not surprisingly for me, of course, the connecting link of these three happenings is God, and of course, God's love. God's love is present to us in the beauty of summer creation, God's gracious gift of this beautiful yet fragile earth. God's love is also felt, we pray, in love that a father can bestow upon his family. And God's love is what we are called to share as we seek the freedom, liberty, and justice for all enslaved people in the world. However we celebrate these three occasions, may we always be reminded of God's never-ending 
and steadfast love. Let us pray. Inspiring and enlivening God, on this first weekend of the summer season, be with this beloved family of faith as we move from a program year unlike any other in our church's history to the more laid back days of summer with creativity, perseverance, and resilience. The faithful people of this congregation have loved one another and have sought to love you with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Even as we now disperse to beaches and boats, to lakes and lazy vacations, the faithful people of First Church will be continuing to give thanks to you, O God, for your never-ending and steadfast love for us and for your world. We hold in our hearts prayers for your creation, for loved ones, for our community, and for the whole world. We lay before you those we know who are lost, grieving, sick, or discouraged. And we pray this day for those who celebrate and laugh and wonder and hope. We lay before you our community with all their needs, hopes, and dreams. We pray for all people of every land, yes, those on vacation, but also those in shelters, living on the street, in refugee camps, or fleeing their homes for their very lives. Protect them, heal them, and help us all to know one another as members of your worldwide family. And we do pray for the world, a world still struggling with the COVID pandemic, as well as the pandemic of economic injustice and the pandemic of prejudice and intolerance. We pray for all suffering people, young and old, near and far, but perhaps especially children, innocent children who tonight will go to bed hungry, homeless, scared, uncertain about their future. And so we pray that our light would break into all the dark places in this world and that you may show us how to be bearers of that light and grace and faithful stewards of your creation in all the seasons of the year. In the name of Jesus, who empowers us by his Spirit, we offer these prayers. Amen. A basic principle of Bible reading is to consider the original audience for the text. Understanding the audience, the history and the context can be very informative and enlightening. Isaiah 40 was written to a nation in exile. God revealed to the prophet Isaiah that Babylon would carry the nation of Judah into exile. Under the inspiration of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the prophet Isaiah wrote and shared a message of hope. Don't despair. God has not forgotten you. God will be there when you are weary. God will be there when you have challenges. In the passage you will soon hear, which is familiar to many, we will hear of that promise of comfort, of strength, and of deliverance. In our second reading, we hear the Apostle Paul truth-telling. Things had been stressful in Corinth with the new church, and Paul and the Corinthians didn't always get along and agree. In the passage, we will soon hear the Apostle Paul is sharing how we will all face hardships and challenges, but despite that, we are called to be faith-filled people. And despite the paradoxes of life, our call to be good Christians never wavers. Friends, sometimes challenging things happen to us individually and collectively, but God is always with us. 
and other people are often there to help us along the way and to help us to remember to be resilient, to be flexible, to be faithful, and to be caring. May the sacred words we are about to hear comfort and inspire us. Our first lesson is from the Old Testament, from the 40th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our second lesson from the New Testament, from Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see, we are alive, as punished and yet not yet killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet always making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children, open wide your hearts also. Here ends the reading of these lessons.
I'm still smiling from our children's celebration Sunday service last week. You see, my cheeks hurt after the service because I was smiling so big for so long. Children have a lot to teach us about life and faith and resiliency. Just recently, I saw this video from the Learning Lab. What does it look like? It looks like me. That's right. I want you to do everything that you can to knock your toy down. Who is the strongest in class? Jerome, come on up, please. I'm going to give Jerron a prop, and he's going to try to knock it off the table. Ready, Jerron? Okay, children, who can tell me what it means to have resilience? Yes, Paige. Resilience means if you make the toy fall down, it'll come back up very, very fast. Very nice. As the description for this video says, there's no better foundation for success than the ability to bounce back from failure or adversity. That is why when it comes to the word resilience, we don't just teach our children how to read, spell, or define it. We teach them how to embody it. Embodying resilience, modeling resiliency, Living through a pandemic has certainly taught us all about the importance of resilience and faith and love. As individuals and communities, we are called to be resilient, hopeful, and persistent, among many other things. Pre-pandemic, I was at a PTO meeting at Andrew and Lucas's school, and two second grade teachers were presenting their belief in the importance of social-emotional learning, not just teaching to the test. They were advocating for a specific curriculum to be added to the Cromwell Public Schools. I hung on every word that they were saying, hopeful that my boys might get one of these teachers who believed in the importance of teaching these children how to be respectful and resilient and persistent. Fast forward to the middle of last spring, we were home doing virtual learning with Andrew and Lucas when we found out that my little Lucas would have Mrs. Haddad, one of the guest presenters at that PTO meeting. I was thrilled. When the boys were home this year doing virtual school, I would listen to Mrs. Haddad speak to her students with care and with love. And I was reminded of some of my elementary school teachers who were thoughtful, dedicated, and loving. Lucas, by the way, loved having Mrs. Haddad and thrived in her class this year. It's amazing how much impact teachers have on their students. Unfortunately, sometimes negative, but hopefully, mostly positive. Thank you, teachers and educators. 
Well, it was sometime back in October, on one of those virtual school days, when I heard Mrs. Haddad lead her students in saying these words, I am resilient. I am, I can, I will, I do. Throughout the year, the students learned about power attitudes, flexibility, persistence, optimism, resiliency, and empathy. Those are important skills to teach our children. Actually, those are important values for all of us, both personally and as a community. As we hear in the Corinthians reading for today, we will all face challenges personally and collectively. Yet we are still called to be patient and kind and loving, honest and strong. I am resilient. I am, I can, I will, I do. Resiliency is the capacity of each of us that we can develop and prepare for life's inevitable ups and downs. Resiliency can help us when we face adversity. We have the opportunity to learn and to grow and to emerge stronger than before. Everyone has the capacity for resilience and it can be learned, strengthened, and put to work in our lives. But let's face it, challenging times and things happen personally, and sometimes they can get overwhelming. We are still living through the reality of a pandemic, despite things opening up. And there are days when some of us are still exhausted it is then that we need reminders that God is still with us, giving us strength and encouragement like those words spoken so long ago by the prophet Isaiah. None of us becomes who we are on our own. We are influenced by others, by parents and teachers, coaches, friends, mentors. The first time that Danny got arrested and put in handcuffs, he was eight years old. He grew up in Los Angeles, first generation Mexican American. When he was 13, he joined a street gang and sold drugs. On his 18th birthday, he was sent to prison with a sentence of 15 years and two felonies. He ended up getting transferred to Pelican Bay State Prison Security Housing Unit, an isolation unit within the maximum security facility in California. Danny was in his cell 22 and a half hours a day. He could talk to people only through a vent or the toilet, and seeing someone was very rare. They were allowed to come out for an hour and a half each day by themselves into a small concrete enclosure with walls that were about 18 feet high. As Danny shared, it leaves a mark on you. Incarceration is a traumatic experience. The hardest thing was understanding that the place was built to break you mentally, physically, and spiritually. Through the wall, Danny started talking to a man who had been incarcerated since 1977. They shared ideas and the older man asked Danny about what he liked to read. Danny explained that he liked reading history books and books with facts in them, but his newfound friend suggested giving fiction a try. He introduced Danny to Oliver Twist, and then the grapes of wrath, and then crime and punishment. Reading inspired Danny to enroll in a GED program and then take some courses through a community college. After serving 14 years, he was released from prison 
and he came home with 48 college credits and he was accepted at UC Berkeley. And on the first day of school, he met Stephen. Danny told Stephen something about feeling uncomfortable around all the young people. And Stephen said, yeah, me too, man. And then Danny told Stephen about how he had been away from school for a long time. And Stephen agreed. And then Danny told him that he was in Pelican Bay, S-H-U. And Stephen said, really? Me too. Stephen spent most of his teens and 20s in the prison system. When he got to Berkeley, he was socially isolated and looking for a place to find community. Together, Danny and Stephen recognized a lack of resources for formerly incarcerated students on campus. So in 2013, they created the Underground Scholars Initiative to support students impacted by incarceration. Danny explained how one of the results of incarceration for people coming home is having to live with the stigma of being the boogeyman, being the bad person, being the animal. Danny is adamant that people coming home should be able to access some type of help to cope with what they went through. And as he shared so candidly, luckily I was resilient enough to overcome the trauma that solitary confinement imposes on an individual and use it to my advantage. Luckily, I found people who helped me along the way. I want to be a resource for people. I want to be able to put people in positions to excel after incarceration. Life won't always be fair or easy, and there will often be times when we feel weary but we aren't alone. God is with us and we have each other. In the early church, the apostle Paul reminds the people of these important truths over and over again. God is with us and we have each other. And then the apostle Paul is often encouraging the people of his day by modeling himself how to be honest about the challenges and the need for reconciliation. Paul is very clear about how we, people of faith, are called to live. As the Apostle Paul himself admits in the passage we just heard, resilient people overcome hardship and tragedy and, yes, imprisonment, and resilient communities thrive despite change and challenges and bumps along the way. This spring, I kind of accidentally had the joy of coaching my boys' first ever baseball team. It's a challenger team, so as many of you know, that means a lot of the children have special needs. The first practice was somewhat chaotic and overwhelming, but also joy-filled. After that first practice, I emailed the coach and asked if she wanted some help with this ragtag group of wonderful children. She said yes. Most of the kids at the beginning didn't have any knowledge of baseball at all. And as soon as a ball was hit, almost every player in the field ran to it instead of staying in their designated areas. It was quite something to see. That first day and then beyond, it became very clear that many of the children had never held a bat, thrown a ball, or ran the bases. Many of them didn't even know where first base was or what it was called. One little girl in particular was very eager to learn all the skills. 
Occasionally, in those first few weeks, she would get sad about not being able to hit the ball off the tee or not catching the ball in her glove. But almost every time, actually it was every time, that another kid would encourage her. You can do it. She never gave up. She always pushed on. Just a few days ago, we had week five of baseball, and that little girl who had never played baseball before got two hits off of a tee, threw balls, and successfully ran the bases like a champion. Children teach us over and over again the importance of perseverance, resiliency, and yes, of being a good friend and a person who encourages others. I don't think any of the Challenger team kids will make it to the major leagues, but that doesn't matter. They are having fun and they are learning that they can do anything with hard work and practice, teamwork and resilience. Friends, life will continue to challenge us individually and collectively, but we are resilient. We are, we can, we will, we do, we are resilient. And we will do things together, encouraging one another, always with the love of God strengthening us this day and always. Amen. We invite you now to join in our commissioning. Let us now go forth into the world in peace, to be of good courage, to hold fast to that which is good, to render to no one evil for evil, to strengthen the faint-hearted, to support the weak, to help the afflicted, to rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. As a faith community, over the decades, we have proven that we are resilient. And there will be more challenges, and we will keep rising up to meet them. We are a church filled with people who have big hearts and who know God is calling us to be resilient, faith-filled, dedicated, and empathetic. This past year and a half has not been easy on any of us, and many of us are still weary. When we feel that way, remember that God is carrying us, inspiring us, in challenging us, and loving us, and that we are called to be God's faithful people in all that we do and say. Friends, go in peace. Go in love, go in hope. Amen.